Mr Speaker, as you know, having sat throughout this entire debate, it has been a passionate debate characterised by many excellent speeches. I commend the members for Tiverton and Honiton, Bolton West, East Surrey, Mid Norfolk, Plymouth Moorview, Broxtow, Stirling, Dudley South, Faversham and Stoke and Trent South on my side for a series of outstanding speeches. But it has also been the case, as uh, the Shadow Secretary of State pointed out, that there have been many powerful speeches from the opposition benches as well. And I too, like him, want to pay particular tribute to the members for Warrington North, Gedling, Ilford North and Birmingham Hodge Hill for moving and passionate speeches. Their constituencies are lucky to have them as advocates for their uh, concerns and their needs. But perhaps the bravest and the finest speech that came from the opposition benches was given by the member for Barrow in Furness. It takes courage. It takes courage, and he has it, having been elected on a Labour mandate, representing working class people, to say that the leader of the party that you joined as a boy is not fit to be Prime Minister. He speaks for his constituents. He speaks for the country. And that takes me to, my, to the speech from the Shadow Secretary of State. He spoke well. He spoke well, but I felt he did not rise to the level of events. But one thing that was characteristic about his speech, he did not once mention in his speech the leader of the opposition or why he should be Prime Minister. Now, now, I have a lot of time for the Honourable Member. We have several things in common. He's lost weight recently. Sorry, I, we've both lost weight recently, I should say. Him much more so. We're both friends of Israel. Him much more so. And we both recognise that the member for Islington North is about the worst possible person to lead the Labour Party. Yeah. Him much more so. Yeah. Now, as well as great speeches from the back benches, we also had some interesting speeches from the front benches. We had a speech of over 20 minutes from my great friend, the leader of the Scottish National Party in this place. But again, in those 20 minutes, he did not once mention the common fisheries policy. I think everyone, everyone in Scotland who recognises the potential to free ourselves from the common fisheries policy which Brexit provides will note that in 20 minutes of precious parliamentary time, the SNP didn't mention them, aren't interested in them, and as far as the fishing people of Scotland are concerned, the SNP have literally nothing to say. Must I turn to the speech from the leader of the Liberal Democrats, someone whom I also have affection and respect for, and he made a number of good points. But he also said that he regretted the referendum. This is from the party that was the first in this House to say that we should have a referendum on EU membership. And because he doesn't like the result of the last referendum, he now wants another referendum. The Liberal Democrat policy on referendums is not the policy of Gladstone or Lloyd George, it's the policy of Vicky Pollard. No, but yeah, but no, but yeah. (laughs) I should also commend the speech given by the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party. He explained that he had been inundated with text messages today from people who were saying, please, 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 Uh, people in this House. Please, please, please back the government tonight. And some of those text messages had even come from Conservatives. And I think critically, when we think about confidence in this country and in this government, there is a daily vote of confidence which is being executed by the individuals investing in this country, creating jobs and opportunity for all our citizens. Under this government, this country remains the most successful country for foreign direct investment of any country in Europe, with more than £1.3 billion being invested in the last year. That is why Forbes magazine says that this country is the best destination for new jobs in the world. It's 
why the independent organisation JLL say the best place for the future of services in the world is here in the United Kingdom. It is why, once again, London has been recorded by independent inspectors as the best place in the world for tech investment. And we see that when Spanish rail firms like Talgo shortlist six destinations for investment for new rolling stock, all six in the United Kingdom. When Boeing opened a new factory in Sheffield to create jobs for British workers. When Chanel moved from France to London in order to establish a new corporate headquarters. And when Starbucks, Starbucks moved from Amsterdam to London. In order, to, in order to ensure more investment and jobs. The opposition should wake up and smell the coffee. Yeah. And all of this, all of this, in the words of the BBC, despite Brexit. <laughs> now that investment, those jobs that have been created under my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister's inspirational leadership, has been invested in public services and social justice. As we heard from the member for Dudley South and Bexhill in battle, 1.9 million more children in good and outstanding schools. It is also the case that the gap between the poorest and the richest in our schools has narrowed under this Conservative government. We also have a record level of investment in the NHS. And thanks to my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Health, a 10 year plan, £20 billion investment, £394 million extra every week for our NHS. And we also have investment in our national security. We meet the 2% target for investment in NATO, and we have two new aircraft carriers capable of projecting British force and influence across the world in defence of freedom and democracy. And in contrast, while we are standing up for national security, what about the right honourable gentleman, the member for Islington North? He wants to leave NATO. He wants to get rid of our nuclear deterrent. And recently in a speech he said, why do countries boast about the size of their armies? That is quite wrong. Why don't we emulate Costa Rica that has no army at all? No allies, no deterrent, no army, no way can this country ever allow that man to be our Prime Minister and in charge of our national security. But if he, if he can't support our fighting men and women, no. Who does he support? Who does he stand beside? Well, it was fascinating to discover that the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition, was there when a wreath was laid. A wreath was laid to commemorate those who were involved in the massacre at the Munich Olympics of Israeli athletes. Now, he says he was present but not involved. Present but not involved sums him up when it comes to national security. When this House voted to bomb the fascists of ISIS after an inspirational speech by the member for Leeds Central, in which 66 people, including the Shadow Shadow Secretary of State, voted with this government in order to defeat fascism, I'm afraid that the honourable gentleman, the leader of the opposition, was not with us. In fighting fascism, he was present but not involved. And similarly, when this House voted to take the action necessary, when Vladimir Putin executed an act of terrorism on our soil, there were many Labour members, many good Labour members, who stood up to support what we were doing, but not the right honourable gentleman. When we were fighting... Order! Order! Point of order, Daniel Rennie. Maybe it is a genuine point of order. Is this relevant? And is this not dangerous? Uh, if, 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 if the Secretary of State were out of order, I'd have said so. I didn't because he isn't. Secretary of State. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And if the Leader of the Opposition won't stand up against Putin when he attacks people in this country, if he won't stand up against fascists when they are running riot in Syria, if he will not stand up for this country when a critical national security questions are being asked, how can we possibly expect him to stand up for us in European negotiations? Will he stand up for us against uh, Spain over Gibraltar? Will he stand up against the Commission in order to ensure, in order to ensure that we get a good deal? Of course he won't, because he won't even stand up for his own members of Parliament.
Why is it that a Labour Member of Parliament needs armed protection at her own party conference? Why is it that nearly half of female Labour MPs wrote to the Leader of the Opposition to say that he was not standing up against the vilification and the abuse that they received online, which was being carried out in his name? If he cannot protect his own Members of Parliament, if he cannot protect the proud traditions of the Labour Party, how can he possibly protect this country? We cannot have confidence in him to lead. We have confidence in this Government, which is why I commend this motion. Order! Under the order of the House.